This is a brief introduction to the coordinate systems used for three dimensions. I want to start out by mentioning some extra resources for this Calculus 3 class. The first two, of course, are the textbooks. This class follows officially follows Stewart's Calculus with Early Transcendentals, chapters 12 through 16. There are equivalent chapters in Thomas's Calculus with Early Transcendentals. If you're going to buy a book, I favored that one. There are also three good online resources. The Math, Math Insight website is from the University of Minnesota, and it is dedicated to Calculus 3 and related topics. You have to follow some navigation threads over on the right-hand side, but this website has many, um, many interactive graphics, and it's a very good website. You might want to take a look at that one. The YouTube channel Math the Beautiful has some, but not all, the lectures yet for Calculus 3. But these are very good lectures. They're very memorable, and I think you can get a lot out of those. There is also Paul's online math notes for Calculus 3. This is one of the first online math websites. It doesn't have the modern look to it, but it is very good. All the writing is exceptionally clear, and every topic is followed by two or three worked out examples. So there's another good website for you. My lecture notes are on Blackboard. And they are, uh, shall we say, terse. Uh, there's nothing much extra in them. All the information is there. They're more of a summary. But I think they're good, especially if you don't like to read a lot of extra words. I just tried to put the essentials in there. You'll notice in those lecture notes and also in these videos that I um, copy and paste, that is, steal graphics from other people. Some of them are from the textbook. Some of them are from the internet. I tried to give credit, but sometimes I do miss giving credit to the excellent graphics that I managed to acquire. The three coordinate systems that we're going to look at for 3D are the Cartesian, cylindrical, and the spherical coordinate system. And in discussing these, we're going to include some topics that have not been fully derived or fully specified. If you're very mathematically inclined, this might seem a bit unpleasant. One way I think you can look at it is to say, um, say you want to learn a language, a new language. You could spend you know, four or five years conjugating verbs and still not be able to order anything at a restaurant. Or you could start with the phrase book. So just think that this lecture and some of the things we're going to say here are just a phrase book. But it's good, I think, to put everything down in one place and to get um, some of the terms in place so we can discuss these systems in 3D. Now, the first system, of course, is the Cartesian system. We all have the XY coordinate system well in mind. And to get the 3D system, you just add another axis, the Z axis. Now, this z-axis has to be added by what is called the right-hand rule. So with this rule, you have to use your right hand to, um, to sort of place where the z-axis is going to go with respect to the x and y. Now, even though not everything in the world follows the right-hand rule, it's still important to know how to do this right-hand rule and what people mean when they start to tell you to put your hand in certain positions. This slide shows the right hand curled. The, ha the fingers are curling from the x to the y-axis, and then the thumb is pointing along z. This slide shows it a little bit better. So instead of ABC, we can mark this as X. Here would be Y, 
and that's the z-axis. And you see how the hand curls in and then the thumb is along z. This use of the hand is frequent in physics and in doubly, um, in a lot of cases in doubly this, this would be your current carrying conductor and here you're uh, determining the direction of the magnetic field. There is another hand position and that involves using the fingers. There are many variations on this, um, these finger positions, but here's about the best one. You put the X on the index finger, the middle finger has Y on it, and then again the thumb is Z. Now it's very good to learn both of these and practice both of these because in various physics and engineering courses you're going to see them again and different instructors favor different kinds and if you know both then that makes it easier. I want to mention another way that the 3D Cartesian coordinate system is shown and that is it's drawn in 2D like this for example. There's the y-axis and you draw x-axis here. Well, if this is a 3D system, there's a z. And by using the right-hand rule, so the right-hand rule, your hand would be right hand would be curling in here, your thumb would be poking out. So because the x is coming out of the board, it's drawn with a dot. Now, if you happen to draw it a different way, let's say you put the x here and the y here, if you use your right hand to curl the x into the y, then the Z would be going into the board. In that case, you mark the Z with an X. So you might see that done. The whole idea here is that the Z axis is an arrow. When it's coming out of the board, that's the tip of the arrow. And so you see that coming right at you. And when it's going into the board, you're seeing the feathers or the veins of the arrow as it flies away. For many things in Calculus 3, we use vectors. Now for vectors, we need a little more than just x, y, z labels on these coordinate systems. And for that reason, we use what are called the standard basis vectors. And they have many names. One very common name is the X is replaced by an I, and I'll explain why there's a hat over it, and the Y is replaced by J, and the Z is replaced by K. Now these are considered to be vectors. Right now we have not defined vectors, so you just think of a vector as an arrow. So this would be an arrow here, this would be an arrow along Y, and this would be an arrow along Z. Now on top of that, they have another as yet unspecified property and that is that they have a length or magnitude of one. So they're called unit vectors. And we call the unit circle had a radius of one, unit vectors have a length of one. So they're, they're small vectors, so to speak, depending on your system, but they have a length of one and they are situated here so that they're along the x, y, and z axis. This isn't the only way that these basis vectors are denoted. Um, here's another way. It's common ex, ey, and ez. That's instead of using ijk. Sometimes they have a hat on them. The hat means that it's a unit vector. Another way is to write the E with or without the hat, but with numbers under it, E1, E2, and E3. That's a very good um, method for um, denoting these basis vectors because it extends immediately to higher dimensional systems. In the first written lecture that's on Blackboard, I included a list from Wikipedia of all the different subjects that Calculus 3 opens up for you or different subjects that use the tools of Calculus 3. 
and many of them are not confined to the 3D system that we're seeing here, or even to 3D. So uh, it's very good to be able to extend the basis vectors, and by using the 1, 2, 3, that's very easy to do. And some people consider the hats to be superfluous. But the IJK is very common. You'll see it throughout engineering, you'll see it throughout physics, and it's been around for a long time, and it, it, it works. For this case, I'm going to erase what's on the board now, and I will draw again that instead of x, y, and z, and, and not doing any arrows, the arrows are seldom done, they're understood, the i and the j and the k are simply put at the end of the axes. So again, that is just using the phrases, using the words of this new language. Um, and these are your standard basis vectors, and they denote or point out the x, y, z axes. Now, it's not important with i, j, k that they are horizontal planes or vertical in the horizontal or vertical direction. And that makes them especially useful. So if you want to put this coordinate system on some object that's slanted in space, it'd be easier to draw on it a slanted or transformed and rotated coordinate system, and the IJK fits that. It works very well for that. But there is one property that they have, and that is they are mutually orthogonal. And what does that mean? Okay, so we have things at right angles. There are three terms that are used. One is perpendicular, one is orthogonal, and one is normal. They all mean the same thing. They mean at right angles but they're used for different objects, and sometimes they're used interchangeably. Perpendicular refers to two lines. For example, you might say two streets are perpendicular. For vectors, the word orthogonal is often used. And it's used for other, in other cases too, but orthogonal, perpendicular, same thing. Normal has a particular meaning. It means a line or a vector that is perpendicular to a plane. So this is a line or vector perpendicular to a plane. So this line could be normal to the plane. It could also be called anormal. So that word normal is used um, both as an adjective and as a noun. For the case of this IJK system, we say they're mutually orthogonal, meaning they're all orthogonal to each other. The I is orthogonal to J, J is orthogonal to K, K is orthogonal to I. So that, um, that's part of the basis system, it's part of the Cartesian system. They are mutually orthogonal. There are certain subspaces in the Cartesian system that are worth pointing out. One are the coordinate axes, or the coordinate planes, I'm sorry. And you can see they're, they're here in different colors. You have an xy plane, a yz plane, and an xz plane. Those are denoted by writing, for example, for the xy plane, that's a set of all points for which y is 0. When you have a 3D coordinate system, you need to denote a point by three numbers. It's just triple x, y, z. If you don't have one of those numbers, it really isn't a point, and it doesn't make sense in the 3D system. When it comes to equations of surfaces, such as a plane, all you need to do is specify one. If you specify one value, it's assumed that the other two, in this case x and y, take on all values in their range. Now, x can vary from minus infinity to plus infinity. y can vary similar, similarly from plus infinity to minus infinity. And that's why you get a plane when you write z equals 0. It's not a point. It's a, it's a surface in 3D. For the yz plane, x is 0. And for the xz plane, of course, y is equal to 0. In the lecture that follows this, um, lecture chapter 12, um, lecture 1A, there's a discussion of the different surfaces and the, you know, the, in different coordinate systems by using this idea of specifying only 
one of the one of the coordinates and letting the others take on all the value in their ranges. Another subspace of the Cartesian system are the octants. You can recall that the 2D system had quadrants, quadrant 1, 2, 3, 4, and they were labeled in the very nice counterclockwise direction. In the 3D Cartesian system, you have similarly octants. Of course, there's eight of them. The first one, all the terms are positive, just like x and y are positive for one. Here in two, x is negative, but y is positive. So in this case, we've moved over here. So this is this is octant one. Back here is octant two, and you continue up here for z greater than zero, for three, and four. So back to one. Then you drop down here for five, and you, again, six, seven, and then eight. So those are the octants, and those are the planes in the Cartesian system. Now let's look at the cylindrical system. This is just an outgrowth of the polar coordinate system, and you can recognize the polar system down here with the r and the theta. So a point in a cylindrical system is denoted by r, theta, and z. So you just have a z-axis added to a polar system to create a cylindrical system. I'm going to show you the basis vectors for the cylindrical system. Recall that for the Cartesian system, I can draw them in here. There was an I and a J and a K or something similar. Here are the basis vectors. That didn't work very well. Let me um, erase that. So I will not do that again. Oh, I can do the circle. There we go, that's right. Okay, there's the there are the basis vectors for the cylindrical system. Physics uses these a lot, engineering does too. But there's something unique about them. When you think of the IJK system down here, it's coming out of the origin and it is tied to the origin. It's along these coordinate axes. The basis vectors for the cylindrical system are defined at a point. If you go over to this point, you're going to have a different, well, those, they rotate and move over there. The basis vectors move. So they're not a fixed entity on this um, on the system like the IJK. As a result, they're not useful for, um, well, they're marginally useful for addition and subtraction of vectors. They can only be used if, say, you had a force vector applied here and a force vector applied here. They're both applied at the same point. Then you could add them. Then you could use these, these system here. But if you had a vector here and a vector over here, a force, say, in those two different things, you, you can't use those systems. In that case, you would take your cylindrical r theta z and you would return it to an x, y, z system. And that is done just like you did for polars. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Let me erase the board here, and I'll write that again. Whoops. X um, is r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and z equals z. So you just have polar here, and z is you know just the same. Going the other way, r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. Theta is the arctangent of y over x. And again, there's no change in z. Let's look now at the spherical coordinates. In spherical coordinates, a point is denoted again by three numbers, and the three numbers have to be a radius from the origin, an azimuthal angle, and a zenith angle. 
the azimuthal angle is measured in the xy plane, and the zenith angle is measured from the z axis. Using the notation shown here, the point would be located at rho, theta, and phi. Although we need all three of these items, they aren't always notated this way. Physics in particular uses phi for the azimuthal angle. That's, this one would be replaced by phi. And the zenith then is theta. This angle is theta. That's just in physics. In math um, and in physics, the way that this radius is, is uh, recorded can vary. One thing we know is that in cylindrical coordinates, the radius, I'll just, I have to write the word radius now because we want to call it different things, lies in the xy plane. This is in cylindrical. But in spherical coordinates, this radius is extending up here into the third dimension. So they're very different. So you want to use different letters for them. I used rho here. Thomas and Stuart both use rho. And a lot of people do use rho in the spherical system and r in the cylindrical system, but not everybody. Sometimes you'll see this denoted r and the rho used here in cylindrical coordinates. In, the, in a manner similar to that of spherical coordinates, uh, cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates also has basis vectors, but they are tied to a point. And when um, a lot of times when vectors are added or subtracted and various operations are performed on them, it's customary to take these spherical coordinates and transform them back into Cartesian. We can look at the equations, but um, it really helps to just figure out what's going on at this transformation. And then the equations for uh, transforming from one coordinate system to the other make a little more sense. You can see in, in this graph that I copied and pasted from the internet, the uh, people who did the graph used r for the radius. What is the radius in spherical coordinates? This r is x squared, y squared, z squared. So it's similar to the radius in cylindrical coordinates, except that the z is added in here for spherical. Now let's look at the zenith angle. And if I make a triangle here, we can see that the cosine of this angle, which would be adjacent over hypotenuse, the hypotenuse is going to be r, and the adjacent length is going to be whatever z is. So when we're transforming back from spherical into Cartesian, we have z equal r cosine phi. So z is just a projection of r onto the z-axis. OK, so what is, if there's an r cosine phi, there's also going to be an r sine phi. And that's what we need to consider here. So the r sine phi is going to be this distance. But what that is, it's transferred down into the xy plane, the same distance. You can't quite see it that well here because this point is sticking out of the page. But this distance here is r sine phi. Sorry, you say that. OK, that's r sine phi down here in the xy plane. So 
our cosine theta projects over onto the z-axis and gives you your z-value. Our sine theta, a sine theta just brings that point down into the xy plane. So this is functioning as the radius in cylindrical coordinates. To find the x value in cylindrical coordinates, you would multiply the radius by the cosine of theta. So in this case, you multiply r sine phi. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Let me rewrite this. OK. I thought I had more room here than I did. OK. Z, whoops. Z is r, or rho, depending on what your terminology is, times the cosine of the zenith angle. In order to get down to the xy plane, the projection is r sine, OK, b. The x value is r sine b, which is that radius. So this distance here is r sine b. I'm projected over into the x-axis with cosine of the azimuthal angle. And then y, of course, the same radius. And then sine of theta, that will give you the y-coordinate for that point. When we look the other direction and we try to write the uh, spherical coordinates from Cartesian, r is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The zenith angle is z, oh, I'm sorry, I'm an eraser here, is the well, the cosine of phi is z over r. So phi itself is the angle whose cosine, so that's arc cosine of z over r, r being up here. And then theta is the angle whose tangent is y over x. So this brings us to another point, and I'm just going to conclude this lecture with a small mention of a review from trig for the arc cosine and the arc tangent function, and also for what I think is kind of a nifty way to remember the angles off the unit circle. And what I'm pointing out here is just quickly you have the arc tangent, and you have And you will have your arc cosine function. Those are two that you're going to be working with. What are the principal values for these? For the arc tangent, the principal value is here from pi to minus pi. In other words, it covers quadrants 1 and 4. For arc cosine, it's 0 to pi. Okay, so it's covering quadrants 1 and 2. If your angle is not in quadrant 1 or 4 for arc tangent or in 1 or 2 for arc sine, then you need to add pi to what you get out. Let's say you put this in your calculator and you come up with a number. You have to add pi for quadrant, oh, I'm sorry, 2. 2 and 3 over here, and you have to add pi for angles that are in quadrants 3 and 4 for arc cosine. Just want to point that out so you can remember that. For most of calculus 3, the angles will all be in radians. If you're working in a particular field, such as mechanic work or some field that uses 
degrees, then use degrees. Be sure to state that clearly, though. Um, and it will be stated. Some problems you'll be given will have degrees in them because that's common. But for the most part, the calculations will all be done in radians. Exact values are also needed or expected. Um, and the exact values are the ones that you can get off the unit circle here. So all these plus on the other quadrants as well. Okay, so to carry around a unit circle, if you don't have it memorized in your head, it's sort of bulky. Uh, I think um, here's a nifty way to remember it. If you can remember these angles, all you have to remember is 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2. These are the angles here. So this is your angle. This is your cosine of theta. This out here is the sine of theta. Now if you write it in this rather, um, I don't know, strange looking way perhaps, it turns it onto a pattern so you don't have to memorize anything. You just think about it. Okay, all the numbers are divided by 2 and the denominators are just going to be counting. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0 or 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. One counting up one, and then the other counting down at the same time. All right, square root of 4, of course, is 2. So 2 over 2 is 1. As you know, you get one here, and of course you get the zero here, and then you go through all the others. So I just point that out if it's of any use to you.